men, men, manly men, 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 manly men, 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 Oh my word. So should we just stay on because it looks like everybody's joining now. <laughs> Might as well. We're a little early. It's okay. I mean, you're going to save it to your um, uh, stories in any way. So it'll be I up am. there for a while. I, I am. I wish I could use a filter on this. This is my first time doing um, IG Live and clearly you can see the quarantine bags. I need you to come over to my house and fix my bag. <laughs> I I did I I must say I actually went into my box and quickly did a, just a little run like I mentioned I, I I was up really late last night doing some looks and mm. now I need to prep for another look but there is a button at the bottom here for filter um there's a little little button you can have diff different filters okay I don't think on my maybe I need to upgrade my Instagram <laughs> sure there we go this is a lot of firsts for me. So I firstly want to say thanks, Charlie, for mm. getting up early and taking time out of your busy day to chat to me. And thank you for participating in the series. Oh, like, you awesome. are the, the first person. How does it feel to be the first person, the first guy? Uh, well, I, luckily you didn't set your, um, your, your bar too high with me for the rest of the guys. So there's a nice <laughs> introduction. No. No, nonsense. No, no, no. no. I, I think like you, you know, a lot of amazing creative um, people um, across genders. So it's quite exciting to see um, who else you've got in store for us. I am quite excited because, you know, I think it was 2016. It was a few, it was a long time ago. I did a hashtag Jackspirational series. And looking mm. back, I know that I focused a lot on women creators yeah. and unconsciously, like I didn't even realize that I was doing mm. that. And when I looked, I did like 12 interviews and they were all women. And I know yeah. I'm a big rah-rah feminist advocate, but I mean, come on, there's a lot of male creators on the web right now, and especially during lockdown, doing their thing. And I just feel mm. like I can use my platform to do a shout out. I mean, I know you personally, we've worked together yes, like, yes. long ago. Years ago, yeah. Um, when I yeah. wasn't good. <laughs> no, you were good. You did my makeup really well for that, yeah, that video we won't mention. Maybe I'll edit it into the YouTube later. I don't know. <laughs> Some of my followers don't know me for that. They only know me for travel. So, <laughs> see, that's the thing. That's the thing. I think that's really cool because we we've got a, a different side to us um, creatively that also my followers. You know, every now and again, I just dip my little toe into the creative um, kind of like the stage, uh, yeah. and everyone's a little bit like shocked, like, "What you do that too?" And I'm like, "Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just look at the face. Just look at the face." <laughs> I was going to mention that. Am I allowed to mention that? Because you are very creative. You are like a Charlie of all trades. And so, I mean, I had to this morning. I was so nervous because I was so excited. My first live video that I actually did pin a few questions, but it's very informal. Um, <laughs> the first thing I wanted to say is I noticed that we're both Saggies. Your birthday is also in November. It is, but I'm a Scorpio. Oh, you're a Scorpio. Yeah, I don't I'm know my stuff. Scorpio. Yeah, no. Uh, but it's cool. so there's, there's a cusp somewhere, I'm sure of it, that we overlap some emotional kind of um, very creative, very stubborn, um, yeah. but very loyal. So that's, that helps. No, very creative and very ambitious. I won't say stubborn, I will say determined. I like okay. that. Okay. <laughs> so, yes. Happy with that one. So, first question is. What does JVR in Charlie JVR stand for? I'm guessing that you're actually Afrikaans. I haven't stalked uh, you fully online yes. yet. So, so it's actually Shaw Janssen van Rensburg. Um, that is my name. Um, okay. But I, I, I was abroad for a couple of years and I worked in uh, New York and Miami. And they just, where I worked, they, for one other reason, they could never pronounce Shaw and they could never pronounce my full surname. So I just abbreviated it. 
um, and everyone called me Charlie uh, from university <laughs> days. And so just JVR. And I mean, I studied um, marketing and, and graphic design. So from there was always a brand opportunity somewhere and JVR just stuck. Um, and I prefer it, to be honest. Look at you. Not JVC, JVR. Not like, JVR. you know. Yes, exactly. So, my, my next question is, because you're quite good at putting brands together and stuff. Where did Charlie X Boy come from? Where did that name and that brand come from? How did you decide, okay, that's what I'm going to call my brand? Well, well it was always, I, I think when, when I started Charlie, um, it's actually Charlie Boy, funny enough. I always, I always had a, um, a, a thinking of like any brand collaboration that you've got is like, a name X, you know, and then the brand name. So it was always, you know, um, you know, Jack's by um, Inglot or whatever. So there's always that X. So I, I, it's sort of like it was a preempt of future collaborations or brands or anything like that. It would be, you know, Charlie by something. Um, but I, when I started Charlie X Boy, it, so people just started pronouncing it Charlie X Boy. And I'm like, well, it's now too late to correct them and I quite liked it um, and it's always like you know Charlie boy I was it's always like a, a, a thing you know old saying that it, everyone if you pronounce yourself Charlie someone will call you in the bar Charlie boy so Charlie <laughs> boy started just there. So, okay. that's quite yeah. cool so it's a very sentimental affectionate title and it just mm. stuck which is great because now everybody mm. knows you by that that's kind of like the Jack, because Jax is my nickname, and now it's just become a brand because everybody knows me by that. So that's Absolutely. great that it's really personable. Absolutely. Okay. And, and that's where Charlie, um, Charlie X Pro started because I realized um, from my journey from content creation in the beginning, you know, four years ago, it was um, my client work and it was my own creative work and all the rest. Um, but then I realized there was a massive transition in the last year or so where I only shared my personal, used Charlie Expo as a personal blog and a personal uh, portfolio. And I realized I'll get brides or clients and they'll be like, well, show, okay, show me what you can do. And then, you know, my portfolio that was Charlie Expo isn't relevant anymore because it's only my own face there. So that's when I started utilizing and um, creating Charlie Expo very recently during lockdown, uh, Charlie Expo to showcase my awesome clients. And I can actually do natural work because my work's quite creative. Um, yeah. And I do hair and I do styling and photography and all the rest. So I want something that's a little bit more professional. And that's where Charlie X Pro started. Okay. I noticed that I have been watching some of your videos and I thought, oh my gosh, I had no idea. I mean, you have some brides on there as well. And you've yes. got some great videos. You've done some collaborations with she Wolf SA. Yes. Um, actually, I just wanted to say, going back to one of those videos, I have a bone to pick with you, sir. You I... said, quote and unquote, you don't like baking. Mm. How am I supposed to live these days if you don't <laughs> bake? Hey, like, I don't know. If anything, Kim Kardashian, that's the only thing that I will love her for is that contouring and that definition. Yeah. So I want to ask you why you don't like baking and, and what can I, what can I do? What can us women do who, you know, they say maybe some are born with it and maybe it's Maybelline and maybe some of us keep Mac in business like me. So what tips would you give me then if you don't like no to baking, what can I do? So, so baking was, a ma is a massive trend, but um, you know, our kind of side lives and years ago, baking is actually a drag trend and it's a stage trend. So what, what does that mean? What did we do on stage? It's we sweat a lot. We've got a lot of, um, we have to have our makeup last longer. Um, you are using oil products. So you're using pan sticks, anything like that. So baking is trying, is locking in and extracting moisture and is making sure that the makeup lasts longer. We are not professional. We, we're not in paparazzi every day. We're not on stage every day, although the life is a stage, yes. Um, mm -hmm. What baking is doing is dehydrating your skin and making yourself look older it's in emphasizing texture it emphasizes uh, fine lines and wrinkles so if you do have a lot of um our ethnic um kind of clientele we do bake because they've got quite oil active oil glands so a lot of um hyper pigmentation so we have to use um kind of thicker concealers or anything that's got more of a oil base to it so we use um, powder to kind of set and lock it but 
for everyday wear, um, you don't need it. You really don't need it. You want a fresh, dewy, youthful appearance and baking takes all of that away, sadly. Um, so I would suggest if you want, if you have a, a safety crust, crutch of baking, rather invest something like in a compact powder to like tap on. You know, the old saying of I'm going to the powder room to powder my nose. That's yeah. it. So you can yeah. just have it in your handbag, have oil blotting sheets. If you feel that you are quite oily, um, if you feel your concealer does not last as long um, as it does with baking, use something that's full coverage, like a, a Benefit Boing concealer. It is amazing. Something that's got dual purpose, that is um, full coverage, but it's got a matte finish or powder finish. Because, um, of course, I mean, as we get older and lockdown just also tires us, uh, we don't want to emphasize the bad. We want to no. make youthful and shiny and glossy appearance. So leave the baking in the kitchen uh, or on stage and rather have uh, utilize other products. For sure. I'm just reading a comment here by uh, William that says, baking, not the lockdown banana bread kind at all. Definitely no, but you can send not that to me though. <laughs> We're going to be sharing some makeup tips and insider tips with Charlie. Um, for those of you who have just joined now, um, it's the Jaxi I'm talking to Charlie JBR or otherwise Charlie Boy. You can find him on Instagram. He is, and quote unquote, he's quoted this himself, the bearded beauty boy. He's got awesome makeup tips. He's also a photographer. He's a content and digital media strategist. Um, oh my gosh, he is just a, a Charlie of all trades, I, I can uh, say. <laughs> a Charlie of all trades. So we were just talking about baking now, and I, you know, I completely understand what you're saying. Um, I'm sad to hear that, though, because, I mean, I do struggle with a little bit of pigmentation, which is why I am always using foundation, concealer, and then I use the MAC um, Studio Fix Powder. On yes. top of that, because my skin is quite plain, blusher doesn't like light blusher doesn't really do anything for me. So I'm mm -hmm. always doing bronzer, and I've tried the contouring thing, but I just end up looking sunburned, like badly sunburned, like a streaky bacon. So maybe I yeah. should just let the professionals maybe book an appointment with you after lockdown, and you can show me what we I'm can doing. Definitely. Wrong. So um, with she with she wolf and I, um, she wolf SA, Hannah, my bestie, beauty bestie, um, we do a series of education and, and discussing a lot of these kind of miseducation that's happening in trend and social media. Um, because what you are now descri uh, describing with your contouring, you're not actually contouring, you're bronze touring. So you're using a bronzer in the placement of contour. So what bronzer is, it's a warm tone, um, but a shadow is a cool tone. So... Oh. You want to use cool tones in your contour areas to have that illusion of more of a, a definition. But there's, it's simple kind of tricks. And the, for me and what um, Hannah and I always echo is skincare is your main thing. It doesn't matter if you use MAC or Revlon or, you know, from drugstore to luxury. If your skin is not a perfect canvas, it doesn't matter what you put on afterwards. So I would rather, if you are struggling with, you know, hyperpigmentation or anything like that, rather invest your time and money in seeing a dermatologist and seeing a rather having proactive skincare in your regime than spending thousands. I love my Mac, don't get me yeah. wrong, but rather than, you know, your skin is timeless. So we trends come and go. So I always say like as a makeup artist, skincare is number one, rather invest your money there um, and correct that because then you'll notice you can literally just use a little bit of concealer and a blush and there you go. You don't need all of the, the bag of tricks anymore. Says you with the perfect skin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But I, I do, I mean, I, I, I've the, I think it's the last year and so I've, I've invested a lot of time, a lot of education into understanding my skin. Um, currently, I'm in a, a proactive uh, skincare regime um, with uh, Skin Smart. Skin Smart's an amazing brand in Cape Town that they actually, you've got an online analysis that you uh, complete. And then they have a personal person that will uh, email you, Shakira will email you with more questions to really pinpoint what you need in your skincare routine. And it's, uh, if you buy from them online, you actually buy a three month partnership with them because they check up wow. every four weeks to see what is working, what's not working. Um, and there's always an online kind of, so I've got a small little breakdown here. 
And I messaged them like, oh, okay, this could be the effect of it. That could be rather stay off of that product. What have you changed in your diet? X, Y, and Z. So it's always, in, um, I think like that is the main thing. And I can use any foundation, but if my skin's not perfect, it does, it's going to look like crap. <laughs> this is true. This is, I have a question for you. One of the followers asked, um, XX Kanya, Charlie, what is... <laughs> do you use and what do you recommend? And if I look closely, I can see that Kanya is um, a dark-skinned girl. Hi, Kanya. Thank you for your question. So what, what SPF would you recommend and what do you use? So I use Korean. Korean um, sunblock and sun, sun protect, protection is uh, the absolute best. Um, okay. it's Korean, Korean skin, just in general, oh, is that what amazing. You um, so no, so any um, Korean kind of skincare regime. So if you've, uh, Korean skincare is quite popular um, for the last couple of years um, because they invest a lot of time and effort in their skincare. What I love about uh, sun protection, Korean sun protection, I wonder if I've got it close to me. No, it's actually in my bathroom. Is they've got SPF 50 triple plus with UV and AV protection. But what's even better, it doesn't create a white cast on your face. So especially if you are ethnic skin or of medium to dark tone, you don't have that uh, fear of going ashy underneath or have that's to cut for it. And that's, I mean, I absolutely hate it. I'm already pale, so I don't want something to be on top of my face that's going to make me look like a ghost, you know? Um, yeah. And it's something that it, it's not oily, it absorbs super quickly. You you're going to invest money, um, yeah. but it's, it's, I think it's flawless. It smells incredible. It's fast absorbing. So any Korean sunblock is a win in my book. Okay. Is, it su is the Korean um, beauty products, Charlie, is it suitable for all skin types? I mean, because some people have dry skin, some people have oily skin. I know I'm fairly dry except for my T-zone. I'm kind of oily. Mm -hmm. um, can, and, and, and I'm very sensitive. Like I said, I have pigmentation. Is Korean products suitable for everyone? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the technology, they've got, I mean, they've got products that's got snail and um, snail extract in it and 24 karat gold. And trust me, it was very weird when uh, we went to Korea, uh, I think it was last year, the year before. And that was my whole trip was to understand Korean beauty. And um, it was phenomenal. We, we stocked up on so many, but we've got amazing um, supplies in South Africa that do stock Korean um, skincare and skincare product. You've got Shop Glow Theory, you've got Lux Loft, you've got Buttercup, and there's a whole array and they're online. Lux Loft is my personal favorite. And they've okay. got a variety of high end to affordable. Um, and they do, I mean, Koreans have perfect skin because they use all of that, but they also str um, struggle with very acne-prone skin, very oily skin, very dehydrated skin. So they have a variety of skin textures and skin issues that I would suggest like Korean skincare, do invest in it. And their social media, our local suppliers like Lust Loft and Buttercup is very active on their social media and will always guide you in the right direction for products. Okay, so Kanya, I hope you were taking notes what Charlie just said now. Um, yes. Another question from Gino. Hey, Gino. One of our males on here wants to know about where can one find Korean products. And by the way, since it's a guy asking, can guys use Korean um, face products? I mean, the skincare products, is it both suitable? Because some guys' skin is actually tougher than women's skin. So is it suitable for both genders? Um, absolutely. All skincare is suitable for all. <laughs> for all, uh, yeah. the only the only difference when it comes to um, a lot of the skincare products is the packaging where it says for man. That's the only see. difference. That's it's cool. the, it's male Fred. Um, I mean, I've got so many delicate kind of bottles on my desk, but it's the ingredients. It's not the packaging that is uh, protecting or feeding my skin. It's the ingredients that is. Um, it, the awesome thing about Korean kind of. Uh, beauty industry, they actually do have a massive subculture that is only dedicated for men. Uh, they've got beauty houses where for foundations, concealers, and all the rest. If you look at K-pop kind of thing, it, that is, they pride themselves on perfection. Uh, sometimes a little bit uh, scary because you think it's filters and then you meet them in real life and they actually do have glass-like skin. Yeah. Um, but they do invest a lot of time and money in, in their skincare and, and beauty. So, 
for local, I say Luxloft. You can always DM me after and I will definitely send links. Uh, Luxloft is great and Buttercup, um, they've got an amazing variety of skincare, skin protection, mud, mud masks, sheet masks, all the rest. Yeah. Yeah. And is it affordable or is it um, like, you know, expensive or medium range? What would you say? It, like there's the a variety, there is a variety, but you also have to remember it's Korean products. So it's, there's import. So uh, the products, yeah. um, you know, a trip to Korea, I won't ex suggest it now, in our time now, but um, I, my trip to Korea, I was looking at how much we cost uh, spent for the flights and all the rest and how much I bought. And I mean, they are sample queens in Korea. That's what I love when, when you yeah. go and shop there because you buy like a thing and you get a whole bag of samples. Um, it's absolutely awesome. But it is, it is a little bit more expensive. It's more of your medium range, but you do get more um, cost-effective sheet masks. That's really great that I always suggest um, that I stock in my kit for all my clients before I start. Um, but then you do get, you can spend up to a thousand rand for a cleanser, but it is incredible. It's incredible. Okay, that's something definitely worth noting and looking into for myself. I mean, I used to use Dermalogica, but then the prices just became Dermalogica and Environ, and the prices just became astronomical. Yeah. I mean, yeah. two pounds yeah. for a cleanser. I mean, who who can afford that? <laughs> so, it gets, it's um, it's nuts. Okay, so let me go back to the script because I have some questions for you. First of all, what I wanted to ask is, you have the most gorgeous red hair. Are you a natural ginger? This is completely. Am, yeah. Okay. This, this is, I, 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 the older I'm getting, the darker my, my hair is getting, but my beard's all natural. So I actually color my hair to match my beard. Um, but yeah, it's funny. The older I'm getting, the darker, I think. Uh, but now it's getting lighter because there's a lot of gray coming through. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. That was actually one of my opening questions. So thank you <laughs> for that. And then I want to get like a little bit more personal. So the mm. makeup side of things. How old were you? when you first discovered makeup and how old were you when you started playing around with it? Uh, okay, so I, I was very, uh, um, be, growing up with freckles and being ginger, I was very ginger uh, when I was younger. Um, you know, you mocked a lot and you teased a lot. So I remember, and I remember this really, really um, like it was yesterday. Um, it was on my way to school. I think I was in standard one. So what's that now? Grade? Three, <laughs> right, three I think. Um, as and I remember I was because our school, my school was very close to where we were living at that time, and I always took the bicycle. And I went to school. I waited till my parents went to work. I came back home, put my mom's foundation on to go back to school because I didn't want to have freckles. So I think that kind of like that power thing started, like the power of cosmetic, and then also struggling with my identity growing up there was always you know a lot of boys would you know put on their mom's dresses and high heels and whatever if they are struggling with their gender identity or not gender identity sexual identity um and i think that's when uh, i started actually playing with makeup more and eyeshadows and all the rest and then it just stopped completely stopped um and i didn't i, I think then i picked up a paintbrush instead of makeup and experiment, experimented with that. Went total emo with like black hair and um, uh, oh my God. went down that road. Um, and then I picked it up again when I worked for Madame Zingara as a face painter. Um, really? Yeah, awesome. years ago. And I think from there, it just like picked up again and seeing, seeing that and then being on stage um, with the burlesque and all the rest, um, that picked up. But I think it, it, the fascination with beauty was a very young, young age. Yeah. Hmm. And so what does your mom say? I mean, your mom knows now that you obviously that you do makeup and styling and all of that. Hmm. Like, hmm. Does she come to you for tips and things like that? I know I used to look up to my mom when she did her makeup back, I mean, I inherited her 70s disco collection eye shadows. <laughs> so yeah. um, what is what is your mom saying and how does she feel about all the makeup and stuff? Uh, no, I, I must say my mom, my sisters and my niece, they absolutely love it. They they try and come and visit um, our, our house as frequent as possible because then they can shop from my, my collection. Yeah. 
So they always come in and they're like, okay, I've got this, I've got that. Like our WhatsApp group is constantly, I need mascara, I need foundation, I need this. So yeah. yes, um, they do frequently ask me to do, do, the, uh, do lessons, but um, they can book like everyone else. <laughs> no freebies. Right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, awesome. And then what else did I want to ask you? Oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask this because I know you've worked with quite a few makeup brands as in um, you were their ambassador, but I'm going to ask anyway, what is your favorite makeup? Like your favorite makeup brand? So and we can... Okay, I, I get this question a lot of um, from people. It's like, you know, what's the best brand? What's your favorite brand? And funny, my answer is like, I've got favorites in every single brand. I, I'm loyal to a lot of different products. You can ask me what's my favorite product. I can't answer you what's my favorite brand because there's products that I absolutely love and swear by from Revlon. And then there's products that I love from Mac. So there's, there's a variety. Um, what I do appreciate currently is I've got a massive bond and relationship with Revlon currently and working with them uh, very um, um, closely the last couple of years and how they've changed their formulation and their brand identity throughout the last couple of years has been incredible. Like every product I pick up, I fall in love with. Um, so Revlon really does have a sweet spot uh, in my heart. But then again, I started with Inglot. So, and I know how Inglot works. So I would most probably, I, I'm between Inglot and Revlon. Um, yeah. But yeah, I love, I mean, you can ask me in any brand and I can tell you what I love from that brand. I feel like that as well. I feel like my makeup kit has got a hodgepodge of everything. Like the Maybelline mascara, I will always use the little pink tube. It doesn't matter what brand, I will always use that. Mm, um, that's classic. From William, tell us more about the skincare and, oh gosh, I just lost it now. Tell us more about the skincare and beard care conflicts. How do you make the two work really well together? So there's an interesting question from a guy. William, thanks for the question. Does yeah. that the beard, the beard care and the skin care. So, so I, it actually works um, a, really well together. I think um, the one thing that a lot of guys are doing, <laughs> not, uh, what are, how can I say, um, they are treating the two areas independently rather than a unit. You've got skin underneath your beard. So I rather, I go in with, uh, products like serums and essential oils rather on my skin because I can massage it through my beard and penetrate my beard. Something that's a little bit thicker, like a, um, a moisturizer that is really high in moisture, I would rather focus around my eye, eye area or my forehead where I really need a moisture boost. Um, okay. I rather use for my beard care, I use more organic products. So that's again my essential oils, my herba oils, my coconuts or anything like that ha that has benefits for your skin as well. Um, and the other thing is um, moisture sprays, moisture mists like your Fix Plus and any fact that that also really hydrates your beard and your skin throughout the day. Um, and also pro tip, Fix Plus is amazing on your hair. If you've got frizzy hair, you can just spray it on your hair. Um, so you. those are little things that I think a lot of guys are like, okay, I've got product for my beard, I've got product for my head, I've got product for my face, but you can actually interlock a lot of those products together. Uh, if you do have a, a beard, I would rather go with something that's a little bit more liquidy, uh, a serum or a oil, essential okay. oil, and you can use everywhere together. I think that would be really great, maybe for one of your series or one of your videos, if you could focus on like the average men and like, because I, like you just said, a common misconception is you have to use mm. different hair products, you have to do different mm. beard grooming products, then you use mm. different creams. And for the average guy, that's just like, that's too much information. I just want one thing. I don't want to yeah. put five different things on my face. Yeah. So yeah, maybe that would be a great thing to discuss. Maybe that would be quite cool. There, funny enough, there, there would have been um, a great series out. Um, would have probably launched next month um, if Corona didn't hit us. Um, and yeah. it's exactly, exactly answering that. I, um, I collaborated with an incredible brand um, and we, we would have done basically that. Educate 
uh, men on grooming and how to kind of like just unlock the best best looking you um but hopefully yeah. hopefully we can do it pick it up as soon as possible and launch it this year or early next year yeah and hopefully get a tv tv sign <laughs> yeah. yes i'll get my eye out on that one mm. good vibes but now we've chatted a lot about the makeup and the skincare part of your creative part of what you do tell me a little bit more talk to me more about nimble media because we haven't touched on your digital digital oof, what's wrong with me digital strategy and your content strategy and that side of you because you are a qualified graphic designer and you have studied that yeah. so tell me more about that side of things and i mean you're currently working now during lockdown god bless technology that's awesome that you're able to do that yeah. and so how are you, how are you finding that how do you find the time to balance your creative side with the digital side because i mean that's also quite time consuming and to create um whether it's makeup or photography that's also time consuming so how do you balance those two um I, for me it, it, i i handle charlie expoy um as as a client um so there is you know you have to work on schedule and all that so nimble media um you know i worked corporate for many a years um uh, switched between uh, from in house to agency and then also consulting for awesome brands and in, um international and local but i realized i i'm a team player but i can't work for someone else um so that's when nimble media started and charlie expo was actually a um a experimental platform so where i could pitch ideas to clients and all my clients are small uh, business enterprises so your smaller kind of guys um i could pitch them ideas with stats from our own platform so charlie expo was actually just an experimental in the beginning to un- understand or and identify different kind of strategies and and kind of formats of writing or kind of um how you're going to approach your audiences and that clearly i did it really well at that point now it's growing really rapidly that fast um but i've got awesome clients and all my clients are in the beauty industry as well from barbershops to hairstylists um i've got now a client that's approached me that is an online beauty retailer so i do keep everything in that realm and i want to space um be unique as a um digital agency for the beauty industry uh, that's the goal um at the moment it is on pause so there's nothing too public um my website i've i've taken down and everything because i just at the moment i cannot um I'm at that tipping point of or getting more members on you know on on board with Nimble Media and then that means I need more clients then it becomes an agency and like I'm not quite sure yeah. if it's yeah. Charlie or Nimble at this moment so but that's been a that's been a, on a kind of tipping scale for for a while and I need to make a decision very fast okay. <laughs> Well you actually answered my question because I mean one of my next follow up questions to that was how do you set yourself apart um from everybody else because there's quite like in Cape Town we live in Cape Town and there's quite a lot of um people who do social media or content strategy and because you focus mm. solely on the beauty side of things that already sets you apart from the competition mm. so mm. yeah Awesome. And then lastly I just want to touch on I actually wanted to just do a quick chit chat for 15 minutes but it's been awesome we've spent With Quite me I can never do that thing. This is great because I haven't been able to chat to you for such a long time. So now the catch up, yeah. the public <laughs> catch up. <laughs> and my last question was in the interview and I know you've mentioned this is one of your best quotes. Um I'd asked you who or what was one of your biggest motivators and if I can just read from the interview, mm-hmm. you know, you said growing up there was a lack of positive LGBTQ role models. Mm-hmm. and those known in the beauty and fashion industry were always portrayed as overly feminine eccentric and completely unrelatable and my motivation is to show a wider aspect of my community to not only break stereotypes but to motivate others to be themselves and i think that is so amazing hats off to you that's so important no it is it is important to show that side because then i don't know if it's been the media or society like you say that there's this always the stigma that if you you know you work in the the beauty industry and you you are gay then you must be overly feminine you can't be anything else <laughs> it's difficult it's difficult exactly so and what i love about you is you are so versatile you do a whole host of creative things mm. you are one dimensional 
And even earlier when I asked if I can mention the, you know, the bearded lady, the drag that you do, I mean, that's phenomenal. Like, you, mm. you don't shave your beard, which is great. It's completely against the norm because mm. when most artists do drag, they completely shave everything. Yeah. Um, you have the beautiful beard. You're just so unique. And I love that about you. So mm. thank you for being so you and being authentic and true to who you are. Um, and not trying to be somebody else because that's really important. I think we need a lot of that. Um, absolutely. I think like trying to be someone else is firstly exhausting. Um, it's, you know, you've always had this pretense and I think social media really, because uh, I do have this platform and I have a lot of younger audiences that do reach out to me and, and ask or from a content creation point of view or how to deal with their identity um, in, in, across family or in environments that they are in. And there's always this whole misconceptions. Like, I don't feel like, you know, I like playing rugby, but I also think I want to do makeup, but I don't want to do, I'm like, you don't have to, like do whatever you want to. Currently we've got a vast variety of incredible artists um, that identify across spectrum um, that can really, that, you know, it doesn't matter what they do in their social life, it's their art shows. And I think that is the main thing. So um, I'm glad it's now currently starting and it's happening. But when I grew up, yeah, I mean, you had the most flamboyant queen. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I have my moments when I'm a very flamboyant queen myself. <laughs> but there's times that I've, you know, don't fuck with me. And I, I'm business is business. And, mm. and some people get very scared, like, where... You know, they say, like, where did this butch voice come from? It's like, no, the butch voice was always there. It just, yeah. you know, you're messing my time now. Business is business. And I think, I think young kids, there isn't, there isn't like a box. And that's so annoying. Um, but yeah. All right. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, I really appreciate it. And it is important. I think more people need that voice, whether, you, whether you're gay or whether you're not gay. And I, I mean, I have three nephews as well. Um, and the mentality, the old school thinking that kids grow up with, like, pink is for girls, blue is for boys, and mm. you can't do makeup if you're a boy, only girls do makeup. It's absolute nonsense. I mean, my youngest nephew loves to cook. And I think his dad always gave him the stigma of, like, okay, boys don't cook. Yeah. And I was just, yeah. if I just had enough, it was oh, maybe 10, 10, 8 years ago. I bought him a recipe book for kids. I was like, look, Top Chef Junior, you can cook whatever you want. Cook your heart's desire. Gordon Ramsay's really? not getting a chef, so what? And so exactly. what? You can do. Why do you have to have a certain stereotype of a certain um, sexuality preference or identity for a certain career role? It's absolutely nonsense. Do whatever you want as long as you are happy. And we absolutely. need more people to speak up for that. So I think it's really great what you do and it's refreshing and I can't wait till the end of lockdown and I really want to see you on stage again because you are an amazing performer you really thank are you. thank you so, yes uh, I'm, I'm I'm very glad that I'm part of the kitty cat club uh kitty cat club crew uh so you can definitely follow us there um we did amazing shows last year um and also with that there there's a lot of experimental kind of platform um, I mean, if you remember, I always questioned um, gender. That was, that was my main thing when I was on stage, was to evoke kind of questioning, especially from your male cis uh, straight audience. I mean, when I'm on stage, they're like super confused. Like, I'm attracted to this being that's got all this feminine grace, but like this golden glitter beard, like what's yeah. happening here? Um, and that's always that's always the thing. It's like if you question something, you're starting a conversation, and you're addressing something that you must probably su uh, suppress. Um, and that okay. comes to my point. It's like creative and the cultures was always portrayed as soft and feminine and fragile, where I felt um, that is actually creative is the strongest platform because we address our emotions, where I feel a lot of straight males they suppress that um because they see it as a form of weakness but it's actually a, a massive form of strength when you actually address mm -hmm. your fears um yeah. and i mean from actors to cooks to artists i think why must um uh, identity or orientation be assigned to a creative passion i think that is complete bullshit 
I completely agree with you. That's 100% correct. And it's just that freedom of expression and having someone to stand up and say, listen, like you say, you push the gender boundaries, especially in burlesque. And for me, that's always so interesting because there's always clearly defined roles. Like women should be seen as this and men <laughs> should be seen as that. And even like, I mean, I, because I identify as a feminist, that doesn't make me butch. That just means I feel that women should have equal rights to men, <laughs> even though yes. it can be feminist, just by the Absolutely. way. I agree. And if I want to wear a pantsuit like Marlene Dietrich, doesn't yes. make me some butch person. It just means I like pantsuits and I shouldn't be judged yes. for that. So Absolutely. it's great to be able to have that. And I'm going to look up the Kitty Cat Club, actually. Are they on Instagram? I haven't, I haven't are, heard of them. Oh, yes, the Kitty Cat Club, I mean, yeah, it would have been, um, I'm sure, you know, everything lockdown <laughs> has affected us all. Um, and literally just before lockdown, we, we were on a, a great roll with a regular um, registen, um, regular kind of um, calendar uh, with the, um, uh, what's the stage name? Alexander Bar, the old Alexander wow. Bar. So we performed a lot there, uh, okay. especially with a new stage. Um, and yeah, we've got a variety. It's uh, all female cast, uh, usually, and then me, that dabbles <laughs> everywhere. Um, but yeah, it's like, it's in incredible from um, classic burlesque to um, circus burlesque to um, singing and, and everything in between. And it's really, it's really a, a, a vaudevillian showcase of absolute desire and despair. It's beautiful. Love it. Love it. Charlie, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. Much it was awesome. Mm -hmm. It was so nice to chat to you and yes, yeah, yes. everybody who's watching the full interview, the full blog has gone live on the Jack's blog today. The link is in my bio. If you want to read up more about Charlie and what he does and where to find him on social media, please go to the link in my bio and click on the link and you'll find all his contact information. You can also work with him. I'm sure after lockdown, yes. I'm sure he'd be happy for that. So Absolutely. yeah. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Super. Charlie, love you lots. Have an awesome Monday. You too. Bye. Ciao.